Hi everybody, I'm Daniel, I'm a Rubyist from the UK. This is actually my first conference that I've been to outside the UK, so thank you all for the warm welcome. Right now I'm a developer at a company called Zappy Store, uh, based in London. And what we do is automate market research end to end. So a typical use case for us will be something like a big supermarket sending out a survey to 100,000 respondents, asking them about, say, 50 brands, maybe 30 attributes that they associate with each one. Um, you'll have things like whether they buy it, their age, their gender, all the different segmentation. And we basically produce all the reporting on that. So that's a ton of data analysis that we need to do. We need real-time interrogation of the data. So you want to be able to filter on, say, different segments or different brands and you still want uh, to be able to have all your statistics update in real time. So that's quite a challenge, because uh, we're a Rails app. So this talk is basically going to be looking at how we've done that, and also the, the other tools that are available in Ruby right now. So I know a few people were asking about data processing earlier already. Hopefully this talk will answer some of those questions. So if we take a step back first and think, uh, what do we actually need from a language to be able to do data processing well in it? Um, the main things that we need are the right data structures for it. So we need to be able to read data in from a variety of sources. We usually want to be able to index that data on some attribute. We want to be able to do fast mathematical operations, arithmetic and stuff. Uh, set theory, things like slicing and filtering. We usually want to be able to do time series, plotting stuff over time. Um, and we'd obviously like to be able to visualize that data nicely. So what are people using for this right now? A big one, although it might seem strange, is Excel. Um, odd one to talk about at a developer conference, maybe. But most of the partners whose IP we automate are still using Excel to do this kind of thing by hand right now. And it's pretty much the default for non-programmers. R is the traditional heavyweight. Uh, it's been around since 1997. It's used a lot in universities and academia. It's pretty much got every statistical function you could ever think of, a ton of charting libraries. But it's not the most pleasant language to work with for general computing. So that's where Python Pandas has really been able to make up a lot of ground. Uh, it started in sort of 2007, 2008. Um, it's got a lot of the same advantages of R, a lot of the same statistical packages now, but packaged in the Python language, which is obviously nicer to work with for general purpose programming. Uh, I guess quite a few of you will be aware of this already. An interesting newcomer, I think, is Julia. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen that before. But it's basically also a, a language purpose written for high performance computing while still hopefully having all the kind of nice things that we like about scripting languages like Ruby. I've not seen it used in a production environment for this yet. It's quite recent. Uh, if anybody has, I'd love to hear about it. So next question, why do data analysis in Ruby? Well. I mean, pe people often say that you should try to use the right tool for the, right, for the job. And so it might seem counterintuitive to want to do this in Ruby at all when we already have those other products. But obviously, we're all here because we love working in Ruby. We you know, enjoy Ruby. We want to be able to do these things as well. And I think also, for many people, data processing is a nice to have, but maybe not the main focus. A lot of people in here, I guess, will be building Rails apps, web frameworks, and so on. And for them, being web first will be the most important thing, but it would be nice to have data processing as well. So it is important that we have that. And I also think um, that more and more, if those libraries aren't available, other languages will start to do the web stuff better, and Ruby will lose ground. Um, if you look at sort of the recent trends in things like machine learning being a big thing, deep learning, 
all these things, most people that are working with them are working with them probably in Python because they have all the packages available, all the community around that. And that all kind of starts with the bottom layer of data processing for large data sets. So, yeah. Moving on. So what is Pandas? It's an open source Python library. The name comes from panel data analysis. And it was developed as a high performance library for financial data, but it's since been taken over by the open source community. It's super fast. Um, it uses NumPy as its sort of underlying array uh, for fast numeric operations. Its main data structure is the data frame, which you can sort of think of like a table in Excel if you like. And the series, which is kind of like a single column in that data frame. It's got great visualization integration through matplotlib. It's got a super active community and yeah, it's really, really fast. A lot of its critical put code paths have actually been ported to C uh, via Cython. Um, it's driving Python growth. So I've got a link to a Stack Overflow blog at the bottom there that was published quite recently that said that uh, Python is the fastest growing of the major languages right now by Stack Overflow metrics. And that that growth was actually being driven by pandas being the most active tag within Python. So our solution uh, is some, a gem called Quattro that unfortunately is not open source yet, but we are looking to open source it soon, which is why I'm talking about it now. Uh, so the first question is uh, why Quattro specifically? And then I'll talk about what it is. So again, our data, as I described, is kind of, it's very loosely structured. Surveys and questions can come in many different forms. It's not always the same. But they're very dimensional. So in a typical survey, we might have you know, a few hundred thousand rows, and we might have 50 or 100 columns, all of which can be correlated, and all of which we kind of need to be able to compare. So we, around, sort of around 2014, we started running into problems where our data sets were getting too large to be able to handle in the only things that existed at the time, which was kind of NRA and GSL which we were using, but we were finding that rapidly the data modeling was getting far too complex for the speed that it provided. And even then, it just wasn't really fast enough for what we needed to do. So we also didn't want to completely rewrite our Rails app because we had a mature product. We had a whole team of Rails developers, Ruby developers. So we thought, what else can we do? And what we came up with was effectively a translation layer between Ruby and Python, or between Ruby and Pandas. So it's kind of inspired by the way that Active Record scopes and Lisp works. It treats your code as data, and it builds up S expressions like you have in Lisp, um, where each expression can then be the input to the next expression and so on and so forth until you have like a tree with nodes. And that entire tree can be passed via rescue workers through Redis to Python workers that then execute that code in pandas and send it back down the wire and we can evaluate it in Ruby. Um, the first thing to talk about there really is the performance because basically it is running pandas. It's very, very close. All that we've really got is the overhead of the message brokering, which is usually in the order of kind of microseconds per, per node. Another thing to mention is that we have, in some cases, um, sort of erred on the side of keeping the API simple and clean. Pandas tends to, tends to be sort of super flexible. It allows you to do a ton of things. Um, so we've kind of tried to keep it as simple as possible while still allowing the maximum functionality. We don't have, or we won't have, a visualization library integrated by default because most of the charting that we do is very custom. And so this is, uh, this is kind of something that I want to show you. This is how you can add a new method mapping in literally just two or three lines. Uh, so that this, this is basically mapping a unique method on so our, our data structure is called the measure table, which is kind of equivalent to the data frame in pandas. 
and this would be adding a unique method on the measure table that does the exact same as drop duplicates in pandas. So that makes this gem sort of super easy to extend and to keep up to date with latest developments in pandas because it's literally just a couple of lines to add a new method. We also have the ability to inject kind of custom Python code at runtime, which we use for sort of stuff that we don't consider to be sensible to keep in the core Quattro engine, things like more machine learning type uh, SciPy libraries. Another gem that I contribute to that I want to talk about because this is available now and is also I find very useful is the Daru gem, which is part of the SciRu library. Um, it's created by Samu Deshmukh in 2014. Uh, stands for Data Analysis in Ruby, although apparently it's also a Hindu word for alcohol, which he took some inspiration from. And you can kind of think of it as being Ruby's nearest native equivalent to pandas. It uses nmatrix as its equivalent to NumPy for fast numerical operations. Its uh, data structures are the data frame and the vector rather than the series. And it also has various visualization libraries integrated. Um, although I would say that they are probably more fragmented and less complete than what you get with Python. So I want to talk a little bit about the community effect that has really driven pandas forward. Um, if you look at the chart there, you can see the commits and the contributors that pandas has, Daru and Quattro. Quattro obviously is not particularly meaningful since it's not open source yet, but just for comparison's sake, I thought I'd include it. And obviously you can see that um, pandas hugely outstrips anything in SciRuby in terms of its community adoption. This is uh, GitHub issues open and closed. And that might seem like a frightening amount of issues for a project to have, but I guess what it really shows is that it's being used a lot. People are reporting issues and closing them. And in fact, there's been more issues closed on pandas just on CSV handling than have been opened across all of SciRuby put together, which kind of tells you that this is a production-ready battle-hardened library. And last one is uh, Stack Overflow posts. Uh, that's the pandas tag. I tried to find it, but unfortunately the Daru tag doesn't exist yet. Um, there have been, I did manage to find about 18 or so questions that were related to it, but not tagged. I will tag them after this talk. Um, and about 20 or so more that were tagged to SciRuby. All of which I would say were answered by people working on the gem. So it's not all bad. And this, you know, this kind of is my next point that just because it's a small community doesn't mean it's not a great community. Um, everybody working on it is super active. They do respond to pull requests very quickly, to issues, to questions, both on email and Slack channels and on GitHub itself. Um, and the gem is picking up within the SciRuby community. More and more people do seem to be getting involved. So I'm going to attempt to show a demo. I was hoping that I would have a slightly higher resolution so that I could do these side by side, but hopefully I, I tried it earlier and you couldn't see anything, so I'll do them sequentially and hopefully you still get the idea. So this is basically just going to be a quick uh, basic example of how you would do something in pandas, if I can get my mouse in. So what we're doing here is we're reading a CSV that I have found on the internet that contains IMDb Hollywood movie data about sort of social media, like the amount of Facebook likes that the actor and the movie have got. We're going to index it on the movie title, uh, remove any duplicates from the data set. Then we're going to merge that on the movie title index with uh, financial data for the movie. Just a quick example of some filtering. So for example, on the director name and um, a string pattern in the genre. Something, you know, a simple statistic like the mean gross revenue by director and the top 10, and then see a quick visualization. And then I'll show how that would look in Daru and in Quattro. So I was hoping to do these side by side, but basically things to look out for are kind of the syntax and the performance. So you can see these are 
pretty quick. Just click through. So we've got like a nice regression chart line there of sort of movie Facebook likes against the gross profit. Uh, we've got our table here of top 10 groups, so like group by, which is a pretty common operation. Um, our filtered data, our original table, our merge table, sorry. And yeah. So we can see that was all pretty speedy. I'm going to demonstrate the same thing in Daru now, which this, so this is open source. No, sorry, that's Quattro. That's pandas. That one. So this is open source right now. You can get this just by doing gem install Daru. That's fine. Okay, so we've loaded the CSV. We can see that was a little bit slow, but still fine. This is interesting. So Daru actually is a little bit more opinionated on indexes. It doesn't let you set an index with duplicates. You have to use categorical indexes for that, whereas uh, Pandas does let you, even though it has categoricals as well. So we'll clean up the duplicates first. So here you can start to see already a little bit the difference in performance, I think. Pause for effect. But we get our result. We can now set the index, now that it's a unique index. We can again load a data frame from a hash. We can merge it. This is the one where you really tell. So this, this takes about two minutes, and I'm going to move on to the Quattro one while this is running. Um, Sorry, where's my mouse gone? Here. So, Quattro. So, as you can see, the performance here is much closer to what we had with Pandas, which is pretty much instant. And there we go. Obviously, like I said, we don't have a visualization library integrated with this because we do that custom, uh, so there's not much to share there. Um, let's go back and see whether the Daru one has finished yet. And it's still going. I promise this does return. I'm not just making it up. In the meantime, oh, well, yeah, one other thing that I wanted to show on the Quattro example was so this, this is an example of where I say that we've kind of kept the API simple uh, rather than implementing absolutely everything that Pandas has. So, whereas Pandas has a join method and a merge method, we've just implemented this as a single reset index merge set index, which basically means you can use it with multi-index merges, even if they don't completely match up, if you're just matching on one or two indexes or something like that, which you can't do with the straight join method. OK, this is actually taking awkwardly long, so I'm going to move on. <coughs> So looking at the performance there, this, this is kind of a table of just the methods that I was running there. Um, we're on 100 times, so you can see that the difference is a bit better. And what we find is that Daru is generally at least two orders of magnitude slower. Quattro is roughly equivalent to Pandas plus, as I said, the overhead per node and per round trip. This might seem very sort of harsh and disappointing on Daru. But it is quite a new gem still. It's basically, uh, at the moment, they're working on a 1.0 release uh, with a stable API. So really getting kind of feature complete has been the main focus and not performance. 
there is work to come that will hopefully improve this quite a bit. Um, so again, that's just that in graph form where we can see the cumulative performance on the log scale. And we can see that Quattro actually does pretty well. But that's quite a naive benchmarking case. Uh, there's actually several things that we do in Quattro that makes the performance better than you would think still. So the first thing is single worker transactions, which is that basically uh, the way it's set up by default is kind of similar to what Tim was describing in his talk of a functional setup where each expression can be evaluated in isolation and will always provide the same result. But by using single worker transactions, we can actually sort of say a, the same worker should process a whole block of expressions so that we can cache, uh, we can shard and cache sub expressions so that if the same sub expression appears in multiple expressions, we don't have to recalculate that portion, we can just take that again. We can also do, we can basically treat it as a compiler because effectively what it is doing is mapping to pandas code. So we can do stuff like tree rewrites and index partitioning, whereby if you do something like, let's say, an arithmetic operation, you're multiplying everything by a scalar, and then you're slicing out some index value, then Quattro can actually be made smart enough to know, OK, I'm only going to take this slice of the data anyway. So rewrite the tree so that I only take that slice from the beginning and only do the arithmetic operation on the subset that I need which uh, obviously means that you end up doing your calculations on smaller data sets and leads to better performance. So the biggest blocker for all of them, this is a quote from Wes McKinney's blog. He's the, uh, blog sorry, he's the guy that created Pandas. And his rule of thumb is that you should have roughly five to 10 times as much RAM as the size of your data set, which is obviously pretty huge. But that's definitely been true of our experience in production. RAM has absolutely been the biggest performance blocker. So future development across all the gems. The first thing to look at there is Arrow, uh, the Apache Arrow product, project, which is Wes McKinney's sort of newest project. And it's basically a memory format specification that supports zero copy data reads for fast access without the serialization overhead so that you can basically avoid this huge RAM spike. And it's also designed to be an interoperable standard so that hopefully there'll be bindings to this for R, for Pandas, for Ruby, so that you can use the same data structure, well, the same data across different structures. With Daru, the next big thing coming up is, as I say, the version one release. And also, there's another SciRuby gem called Rubex that I'm going to look at in just a second that will hopefully allow us to rewrite some of its slowest portions as C extensions, uh, the same way that Pandas has done with Cython. Pandas has kind of moved to JIT compilation a little bit for places where they found extra optimization needed. So they're using Number, which is based on the LLVM stack. And for Quattro, the biggest thing is going to be open sourcing, obviously. Um, we're hoping to do that quite soon. So if we just take a quick look at the Rubex example, I'm not sure if that's clear, but I did put it on separate slides just in case. So this is just uh, a simple example of how it should work. So this is kind of your standard uh, function that you might write in Ruby. This would be what your typical C uh, extension might look like for it. Not so pleasant to write necessarily if you're not a C developer. And this is how you could do it in uh, Rubex, basically just by declaring your types. And it'll compile down to C code. I would say this is still quite early days. Um, for example, it doesn't handle recursive functions well yet. Um, it's not, as far as I know, been tested anywhere in production. We don't even have it in Daru yet. But it is the next thing I think to look at is uh, going to be integrating this into Daru. So some closing thoughts. Actually, before I do this, let me just see. Yeah, I just want to prove this has now returned. <laughs> and the rest of these are quite a bit quicker. So we can filter fine. We can uh, group by, find the mean, and sort top 10. 
and we've got, um, this is just a simple visualization example, but giving a similar plot to what we had in pandas of a scatter of the likes versus gross. So, yeah, just some closing thoughts on this. Basically, I think it's pretty clear that if you're doing hardcore data analysis and you've got large data sets or extremely high performance requirements, Right now, pandas is going to be your only option. Um, but I think, realistically, we're not that far away from hopefully having Ruby be good enough that it's not something you turn away from. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind that pandas started out 10 years after R um, and has been remarkably successful. So the fact that we are maybe a few years behind is not necessarily devastating. Um, Quattro being released, I would hope, will really drive adoption of Ruby for data science. I really hope that people get to using it. And yeah, I would say get involved. Uh, if you have data science requirements, do check out the Daru gem, do contribute, uh, do watch out for pandas being open sourced. Lastly, I would like to say thank you to the people that have helped make uh, these tools possible. So at Zappy, that's Brendan and the rest of the Quattro team. At SciRuby, that's Samir and the rest of the team. And at SciPy, that's um, Wesley. I would also like to point you, if you're interested in this, both Brendan and uh, Samir have given excellent talks on uh, Quattro and on Daru in the past that are worth Googling. And yeah, obviously feel free to contact me or ask any questions now or later. Daniel, we're going to take some questions on, on pandas or any of the data processing libraries. Sure. So we like stuff like Daru, right? I mean, the performance issue. That, can we like solve it like how we used to solve most Ruby problem? Can we just throw machines at it, and or is it just really a fundamental language problem that make it slow? <coughs> Tough question. Um, I think ultimately, if you, if you look at how Pandas has gotten so fast, and that's really what you're comparing it to, right? Pandas has gotten so fast by hugely leveraging C code, Cython, C extensions. Um, and I think it's always going to be difficult to compete with that in pure Ruby. Um, obviously, there may be a way. But I, I would say, realistically, probably you would want to go the same route and start using something like Rubex to start compiling some of these down. Yeah, a follow-up question about Rubex, right? Yep. So instead of using Rubex, which basically is just like Ruby with some extensions, like you need to uh, type and all that, right? Yeah, so you, you basically provide it types for it. I'm, I yeah, uh, but uh, why instead of that, just not move to like Crystal or something like that? Ooh. Because it's basically Ruby with type, right? Sure. <laughs> uh, I guess because this is easy to integrate into existing Ruby projects that... Um, so I, I, full disclosure, I don't know enough about Crystal uh, to make a full comparison there. But what I would say is that you can just install this as a gem and it'll work with your existing Ruby code. So I think that's the primary advantage. That's pretty good. Any more questions? Chris? Um, so would, um, would releasing um, Quattro as an open source project motivate you, uh, sorry, would getting off the community and motivate you to release it as open source? And if so, what kind of help do you need from the community? So I think the, the, the kind of the first question was, is there interest in the community in this being open sourced? And I think from the sort of questions that I've heard around these two days and sort of the response that we've had in other places, I think it's clear that there is some demand for data processing in Ruby, and I think that probably there are people that would want to use this. Uh, we are quite keen in the company to get this open sourced as quickly as possible. Uh, I think the blocker at the moment is not so much uh, anything that sort of can be helped with. It's really just cleaning out the last of kind of client IP in the code and making it uh, ready to be released. Right which the, the majority of that work has been done, but there is just you know, a little bit left. Yeah. All right, that's a good question. One more question. Yes, please. 
How do you set rules for data analysis? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the first bit. How do you set rules for data analysis? As in how, wh how we make sure that our modeling is sort of statistically valid, is that what you're... So in, in our specific context, we do that by quite tightly controlling the data. So we work with our partners to structure the survey. So we, we work with leading market research agencies, and they provide a lot of the methodology that makes sure that you know, the way we gather the data and the way we process it is statistically valid. And this validation happens uh, by setting rules or uh, that that, that uh, for the most part happens automatically. It's um, that's kind of the business we're in is trying to eliminate as much of the manual process of that as possible. There is obviously still some, but uh, the vast majority of it is. <coughs> All right. All right. One more round. Before Daniel. Thank you very much. And uh, just a final thank you to Jimmy and the organizers for having me here as thank well. Thank you so much.